What is going on, YouTube? Uh, Andrew Miller, Tarek LaCour from uh, HookemHeadlines.com, the Hook'em Horn Show. Uh, we're coming back at y'all today. I'm back in my normal setup. Um, I know uh, last week I got one or two videos up where I was where I was on the road. So back to normal quality, things like that for y'all. But um, we're taking a, a little bit more in-depth look at the uh, Texas-Washington game for the college football playoff semifinals uh, at the All-State Sugar Bowl. Uh, the Caesar Superdome in New Orleans. Uh, it is what Monday night, 7:45 Central Time kick. You know, yeah, that, that's a fair point because uh, both teams are. I think both teams are going to end up being pretty pass heavy. We'll get into some of that though. Um, and yeah, this. I mean, we had a rematch here of last year's Alamo Bowl. Um, obviously, both teams this year much improved compared to last season, but still some familiar faces on both sides. You know, for Washington, you got the Heisman runner up, the kind of the key cog in the machine that makes that high powered offense run the nation's top passing offense. Um, Michael Penix Jr. Um, got the pass for over 4,200 yards or well over 30 touchdowns this season. Um, you know, he's been he's been solid for them. They also have arguably, you know, I think some people would argue the receiver that had the best season in college football this year with Romo Dunza. Um their Richard Jr. wide receiver, absolutely sensational talent, six foot three, 200, uh, 200 pounds about. And, you know, he had a sensational season too. led the Pac-12 in receiving yards. Texas, though, got a ton of weapons of their own. And, um, you know, this defense, uh, the defensive front, I think that this is a group that Washington really hasn't faced yet in terms of just how stout they are. Um, you know, I, I, I think that before I get too deep into any of these matchups, though, just Talk about kind of high level the way we're looking at this. Um, we're going to take a look at the Washington offense versus the Texas defense and then vice versa. Uh, we'll name a couple of X factors for this game. And then we'll do our game predictions as well. Um, I, I also did an article on the site today talking about underrated players for Texas that they could get more snaps. And I do kind of want to take a, like an angle of that, like what breakout players from the Texas side. I'm not going to talk about Washington because obviously we're not as familiar with them beyond, at least for me, film study, some pretty pretty deep dives on data as well for them um, that I've been doing here for the last few weeks. So, um, but at a high level though, Tarek, you know, I, I know I did the early preview with Shane here. What's, you know, what are your thoughts coming into the game? Cause we, um, my first takeaway is that I'm, it's just, it's amazing to think. <clears throat> so January 2nd, 2024 will be three years to the day that Steve Sarkeesian was hired. And so on that third year to the day, he could be playing for the national going, you know, having his team playing for the national championship six days from then. So that's, I don't know that anyone believed that that was going to happen when Sark was hired. <clears throat> Even as a Sark fan, I didn't think he could get it done that quickly, but here we are. So it's just, it's very surreal. Um, <clears throat> another big takeaway is how healthy Texas is. Don't have any major injuries. You have the week you have this couple weeks off to really recharge so you're going to come in very fresh very fast uh sadly Derek williams will have to be out for a half but hopefully we can contain that keep that to a minimum and while this is a repeat of the game we played last year i think that in many ways washington i, I don't see what i see washington as very similar to last year in the sense of I think they were just as good this year as they were last year. Like they don't seem like a vastly improved team, but I do think Texas is a vastly improved team. So that'll be interesting. Uh, a big thing is, you know, Washington had these really good receivers last year and we knew that then and uh, Texas played them well, uh, whereas Texas did not have a, <clears throat> real number two and things like that. Quinn Ewers was still figuring it out. And of course, we'll never forget those two back-to-back -back drops from Xavier Worthy. Um, hopefully he gets to avenge those. So <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for this matchup and uh, may the best team win. Also, you have to hope for Sark that he wins because if he loses, he will be zero and three against Washington since he's left Washington. He lost to them at USC. That was the last game he coached at USC. He lost to them last year, obviously, sour taste in mouth after that. And then to lead Texas to their first playoff game and to lose to Washington again, it's like, okay, Washington just like keeps fighting you. So 
let put let's put that one to rest. Though having said that, I do think Kalen DeBoer is uh, maybe arguably a top four coach in college football. He's a really good coach. So he is a good coach, and he's definitely one of the, I think one of those like just elite offensive minds yeah. in college football. That he's definitely proven that. Um, you know, uh, I, I did want to, I, I did want to follow up on what you said about just the improvement, or I guess lack thereof for either team um you specifically had mentioned washington there um obviously texas is an improved team um i I think in almost every area this season i at this point i guess outside of the playoff maybe the ground game just because you lose jonathan brooks and obviously if you're talking about last year compared to this year you had Bijan robinson rush johnson as your two-headed monster in the backfield last year um you even had jonathan brooks in the bowl game last year he was uh, really solid in the second half. You don't have him now. Um, but Washington this year uh, is improved in ESPN adjusted efficiency in uh, opponent adjusted efficiency as well. And FEI, if you're a person that just doesn't like the, I know a lot of people don't like the college football power index. They think a lot of the blue bloods get a little overrated there, but yeah, Washington eighth in opponent adjusted efficiency and FEI and then Texas ranks sixth on defense. Uh, I believe Washington is 20 yeah 27th Texas is 7th uh Washington on offense is ranked 6th in the nation in adjusted efficiency Texas 15th so I you know, I thought Washington was number 1 <laughs> LSU number 1 ah um, okay there yeah um a- after that though yeah you, you got a whole mix of teams anyway um it's so I think that's a natural transition here to talk about You know, the first matchup I'd like to just at a high level, it's Washington's offense versus Texas defense, um, which I think is actually the strength of both teams. Um, You know, Texas's offense was performing at a very high level in the Big 12 championship game when Quinn Ewers is on and, you know, Texas is healthy at the skill positions, especially and can, you know, spread the ball around to their playmakers. They're not where Washington is yet. Sorry, they're not where Washington is yet. No, they're not. And I mean, to be fair, Michael Penix, six year senior quarterback, Quinn Ewers hasn't even finished his second full year as a starter. If he comes back next season, then I think your those expectations are going to be raised. But, um, you know, Washington this season, uh, they've been an offense that is still very pass is still very pass heavy, uh, a little over 50 percent of their or 50, excuse me, 57 percent of their uh of their plays on offense or passing attempts that ranks 10th in the FBS. Um, they don't run very fast on offense. Uh, they ran or they average about 65 plays per game, uh, 65 or 66, which actually ranks around 90th in the FBS. You'd think with, you know, how fast they can run and with how explosive they can be on offense. I think a lot of times people conflate, you know, those spread pass happy offenses with offenses that run at lightning fast tempos. And that's not always the case. Yeah, they're not they're not the Oregon of the early like of the late 2000s, early 2010s. <clears throat> right. They they take their time a little bit. They do they do like to open up, you know, they do like to open up the ground game after hitting you a couple intermediate deep shots as well. Um, you know, they really like to space you out and then run downhill with Dylan Johnson, thousand yard running back guy averaging well over five yards per carry. Mississippi State transfer that's run the ball really well for them this season. Good physical runner, bigger back. Um I, I think that he is a good back. In fairness, I don't think he's the best back that Texas has faced this season or anything close to it. Um, for for Texas, the, the main thing you got to worry about here. Who do you here, think is the best back we've faced, Ollie Gordon or Tosh Brooks? I think that Ollie Gordon is the better <laughs> – I think that Ollie Gordon is the better back. I think Tosh Brooks was the better back to run against us. Yeah, I, I, I'd buy that. I, Taj Brooks is just a bowling ball. You can't bring him down. Whereas like, cause his, I, I think the tech and anyway, yes, different conversation. Um, but yes, we, we did a good job. I think for the most part, Taj Brooks still ran pretty well against us, but we really contained Ollie Gordon, which, you know, how we've been able to contain some of these insane, like the people can overlook this, but the big 12 had some of the best running backs in the nation this season. You mentioned two of them at Kansas state, you got DJ Giddens, who was tremendous. Um, I think that, he went nowhere against Texas. <clears throat> right. Kansas, Devin Neal, uh, Daniel Hyshaw. Um, I, I think we faced a lot of good running backs this season and did really well against them. And so, you know, Washington, I, I, it's not it's not the run element of their offense that scares me because if, you know, 
if they try to take, I don't think they will. So, you know what? I don't even need to get into that. But, um, you know, talking about their passing attack, obviously that's what scares you. Um, they, they like to hit a lot of those intermediate and deep shots. Um, you know, they obviously like to get Romo Dunze the ball as much as possible, but they don't need to get him the ball all the time because they have multiple weapons that they can spread the ball around to. Jalen Polk, thousand yard receiver. He really rose to the occasion this year because Jalen McMillan, guy who entered the season with pretty high expectations coming off a sensational 2022 campaign, um, suffered some injury issues um, and, you know, missed some games where Holt kind of picked up the pace there. And so McMillan, where he had a little under 500 receiving yards this year after being one of the best receivers in the Pac-12 again last season, um, Polk's kind of been their guy. And so. Um, but Texas, you got you got three receiving threats here that I think you really, really got to worry about and you got to be prepared for. Um, but there's ways that Washington can attack you that Texas has, you know, that Texas has had weak spots at this year. Obviously, the spread offense we've seen multiple times this season with Texas where you know, teams spread Texas out, especially if they got capable receivers or, you know, good experienced quarterback or both and, and can really pick Texas apart. Houston did it with some dynamic receivers that they had. Um, one of which is now at Texas, um, you know, Kansas state was able to do it because Will Howard, you know, was able to stay composed back there, sit back and really just pick Texas apart in the second half and TCU, you know, Josh Hoover for some of the mistakes he's made as a first, first year starter at quarterback after Chandler Morris got injured. He has a big arm. He's got some arm talent, you know, Savion Williams is a problem on the outside. And so, um, that, you know, obviously it's that spread element to the offense that kind of scares you. They can hit their deep shots. Odunze is a, a fast guy, you know, track level speed. It's not only that he has that like that short area quickness or that short speed and acceleration. He's got that long speed. He was like a 200 meter dash runner in high school, ran around a 21.2 second. Roma Dunze is the receiver that you create on Madden. Yeah, I mean. Well, actually, no, he's the second one you create on Madden after you make make Marvin Harrison Jr. <clears throat> and. You know, it's funny you bring up Marvin Harrison Jr. with the whole Romo and Dunze conversation. I mentioned it earlier. I kind of hinted at that where, you know, there's a lot of arguments to be made that Odunze had the better season. You know, Washington had the more prolific passing attack. Odunze had more consistency, I think, this year. He had 900 receiving yard games. He had no single game with less than 60 receiving yards. Um, he's you, you don't really shut him down completely. For Texas, you just hope to limit him. And I think that's where I can start the conversation here with looking more specifically at some of these matchups from the Washington offense versus the Texas defenses. You know, I think Texas did a pretty solid job last year against Romo Dunze. They did a good job of keeping the play in front of them, disguising a few different coverage looks, mixing up the coverage looks as well. And, you know, he he was held under 60 receiving yards in that game. I think he had like 57 on, on around a half dozen catches. And, you know, Texas, for all that it was worth last season, did a nice job of keeping the play in front of them, which is difficult to do against this Washington passing attack that has the most deep uh, passing yards and most deep receptions of any team in the FBS. So um, is there anything that you think we could do here to you know, maybe limit his production beyond just maybe some employing a similar strategy to last year? Well, I think that one thing that's going to be different for Washington that they haven't seen is the def the quality of the defensive line for Texas. Um, Washington is said to have the best offensive line in the country, but they're pretty small. Uh, their center's like 280 pounds, something like that. 6'2", 275, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Sweat's going to be over 100 pounds larger than them. Um, or almost a hundred pounds and probably about two inches taller too. And he gets really low. <clears throat> so you can, and you can double team him with guards, but don't forget you have bowling ball, Byron Murphy next to him and Alfred Collins, who's a freak. And if you double team sweat, you're going to leave room for Anthony Hill to blitz through the A and B gaps. And uh, <clears throat> you know, he's kind of a hard guy to stop. So that's, that gives me some pause. I mean, for example, Oregon played Washington, I think, the best this year. But their pass rush is more from the edge spots, which gave Washington enough time with the tackles where they're going to have to stop you up the middle for. And Penix, I think, if, if we can flush him and get him on the run, 
I think that will be helpful. Um, you're not going to completely stop Washington. In a, uh, Penix is an NFL caliber quarterback and, and the first round level talent. Adunze is a first round level talent. You're going to give up some plays. So just get over that one, I guess. But you do have, I think, the best, one of the better defensive coordinators in the country. You've had almost a month to plan for this game. Um, <clears throat> obviously, Pete K knows the team well. And he's going to, I think he'll have a good plan ready to go. I do hope to see uh, Jade Barron used in a variety of ways and not just pigeonholed at star, move him around safety, move different, just give, give Washington different looks and then do different things that way. I think you have a the kind of secondary that can really do that. And so you got a chance. Uh, you're definitely going to have to pressure Penix, though. But um, <clears throat> I'm not too worried about stopping the run. If Alabama couldn't run on you and all those other teams couldn't run on you, then I just don't see any team running on you. I, I thought Iowa State, which has a pretty good offensive line, and they're bigger and physical. You know, those are the, the farm boy offensive lines. Uh, and by farm boy, I just mean they've, you, there are certain, there's certain times of strength that you measure with weights, and then there's just brute strength. Uh, and Iowa has, Iowa State has that, <clears throat> and they were getting pushed around. And Michael Penix probably shouldn't have said, yeah, they're good, but they're not the, the, the Philadelphia Eagles. I was like, ooh. I was like, mm. it's like, what are you thinking, dude? <laughs> it's like, well, Look, for our listeners who are very, who are uh, into uh, you know lit, uh, <clears throat> literature, you're very familiar with Aslan from the Chronicles of Narnia. And what's that line about him? Aslan is not a tame lion. Tavondre Sweat is a lion, and he's not a tame one. <laughs> you irk him, he will hurt you. So that probably wasn't the the, the way to go. So. I'm I'm very excited to see the defensive line. I think they're going to be. I think this is going to be a great matchup, because <clears throat> one thing is PK has made such great adjustments this year. Every time like someone was doing something, PK adjusted. Now it didn't always work for, but PK still made the right adjustments even when it didn't work. For example, uh, OU's playing right now. PK made the adjustments to like spy Gabriel from time to time. It's just. They didn't make the play, but it was like, well, PK did the right thing. So I, I said, and uh, Penix is not the runner that Dylan Gabriel is. So I wouldn't be worrying about Penix gashing you that way. So that's good. So very excited to see that. And, you know, may the best chess master win between Grubb and PK. I'm putting my money on PK. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I think we're, we're going to... Yeah, I'll get into that in a second. To 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 address what you were saying about Michael Penix, yes, I was going to mention that just because, like, eventually, and you might have alluded to this, someone it feels like someone would have to like kind of learn from what's happened in the last few weeks, where like <clears throat> nothing was as egregious, I think, as what the Iowa State offensive lineman Jared Hufford said said a few weeks ago or last month. Um, you know where saying that yeah that guy there. that guy had a death wish <laughs> yeah and then obviously byron murphy and tavondre switch just absolutely went off that game iowa state's held to negative rushing yards for the first time in however long that was over a decade and i i think that um you know i i think that oklahoma state did a similar thing where mike gundy didn't necessarily give bulletin board material i would say but where he said that basically we would block byron murphy and tavondre sweat like anyone else um, and, you know, maybe just double team them. And that didn't work well for Oklahoma State either. I just okay. think that let me put this in comparison to uh, Hufford, the guy that said that he was 6'5", 325. And you saw what Sweat and Murphy did to him. Mm -hmm. The center is much, much smaller than that. Yeah, you're right. And, and yeah, Tavondre Sweat probably is strong, would probably be the strongest guy on just about any team in in the FBS. Did if you ask ask Alabama. <laughs> ask Jace McMillan when he, uh, McMillan when he couldn't move anywhere. There's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even and even so, I think that 
Tavondre Sweat's comments were almost more complimentary to Washington's O-line in the press conference this week than Penix's were to Texas's defensive line, where I, uh, you know, I uh, Sweat was asked about facing Washington offensive line, which you mentioned some people think is the best in the nation. I would say there's some there's some credence to that. They've they rank ninth in the power five in pass blocking efficiency. Um, and they rank in the top five in sack percentage allowed. And so um, they've done well this season. I think you could argue for a team that doesn't have a dual threat quarterback, they've done like really well. They've done really well. And, you know, they faced some good pass rushes in the Pac-12. Utah definitely has some guys up front. They have a top 25. Uh, they have a top 25 pass rushes in terms of pressure rate. Um, Oregon, you mentioned, has some good players. But I think it's just all about the matchups here. You were saying we we can collapse the pocket from the interior, and that's something that a lot of teams, pretty much any other team in the Pac-12, couldn't say. And so, you know, it's a different type of matchup where we still have the edge play. I think to be able Texas to clean is, up those. Here's the here's the here's basically the best way of saying it. Texas is looks and plays like an SEC team, and Pac-12 teams don't do well against SEC teams. So You're right. Usually, just kind of the way it, kind of the way it is. It, so because you're not the the way the Pac-12 plays football is just isn't you it's not conducive to teams that play bully football, and we'll talk about this on the offensive side too. But Texas can play bully ball on both sides. Washington may win this game. They are a very good team. I want to make so all the Husky fans who may or may not be watching this, who are going back to my comments from last year that I stand by because I don't think that Penix was a Heisman guy last year i do think he i I would have voted for him this year um but the pac-12 they kind of play that speed ball that's not overly physical um now washington i will say they're they're a more physical team among the spread teams but they're but washington's not going to bully texas they're not going to push texas around um they may win because they're definitely good enough to beat texas but Texas could push Washington around on both sides of the ball. <clears throat> yeah. Ward could, but I know Washington will not. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's fair. Um, I, I, so wanted, next thing I kind of wanted to talk about with the Washington offense, um, specifically, what they can do in the intermediate and deep pass game. This was really the last thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to the Washington offense versus the Texas defense. You know, I've talked about Romo Dunze already and just kind of the high level of their receivers, obviously Penix, spectacular quarterback. I I don't I don't think there again, there's any way that you completely limit or shut down Romo Dunza. I think if I think if that happens where he gets under 60 receiving yards, I think you're more than likely looking at the stat sheet and Polk and McMillan have gone for over 200 receiving yards combined. I think that these three are too good to completely hold at bay. Um, you just got to You got to limit what they do. Um, I had mentioned a stat in I uh, in the early preview that Shane and I did where I think for Texas, I think a lot of this game is just preventing Washington from hitting too many deep shots. Um, Washington, when they have under a hundred deep passing yards this season, um, they have been on upset alert against some not great teams. Arizona state held them at bay there. Stanford held them at bay. Um, I'm forgetting Arizona. Arizona is a good team. I don't want to get that wrong, but Arizona is not a fantastic team defensively. They're good, but Washington wasn't Washington. I don't think was playing up to par that game. And so, you know, the key for me, the key on defense is twofold. One, you got to limit the deep shots Two, collapse the pocket from the interior. And I think obviously those two will play into each other because if you if you're giving Penix only a couple of seconds to throw before he's coming under pressure for one, he's just not used to that. Um, you know, he's not used to someone, you know, just getting in the way of his throwing motion from the interior, whereas he's an experienced quarterback, good footwork, can step up in the pocket and throw if there's edges coming at him from the outside. But coming from the interior, he doesn't have it because what? He doesn't have the highest release point. He's not the tallest quarterback. You know, to a guy like Devondre Sweat that, again, is like six foot five, has and five and batted, five, six batted balls. You're not going to be throwing it deep quick. <clears throat> you got to right. you gotta, you gotta give that time. Right. And 
that's that's another big thing with a lot of these. I guess that that's something I meant to mention was a lot of these, you know, a lot of these like routes that Washington likes to target often, they like to throw to the intermediate and deep parts of the field. Uh, Penix this season is uh, one of the 10 highest graded throwers in the power five on deep and intermediate targets. Um, but he ranks in the middle of the pack uh, behind the line of scrimmage, which I mean, behind the line of scrimmage, they just don't do a ton of like, they don't do a ton of stuff in the screen game or swing passes or anything like that. So that makes sense. But in the short passing game, you know, they, they don't work that much there either. He's not super comfortable with doing that. And so, um, you know, Texas, if you can, you know, if you can get pressure on him, if you can get some bull rushes and really, you know, blow up the pocket, you're, you're going to have some success there. Now you're, you're really going to need the secondary to show up here. We, we can't have safeties that are not identifying route concepts. Kind of know who I'm talking about there. We're short Derek Williams in the first half. So that's, that's going to make things a little bit more difficult at safety. That's where I think you can probably pull over Jody Barron to play a little bit more safety. Like you were talking about, we're going to need, we're going to need him. I think more, um, I think we're going to need him more deep coverage, covering stuff a little bit more on the outside than we would traditionally with him playing at the star position, um, especially with Williams out in the first half. And so, um, I also think this could be a big game from Malik Muhammad. You know, his cousin's playing on the other team in this one. Um, he's been sensational in the last two weeks. Highest graded. He's actually the highest graded Texas cornerback in coverage in the second half of the season. He's been really good. And um, I think his length, his physicality, you know, he's faster, I would say, on the boundary than Ryan Watts. Granted, we're going to need both of them to be really good. So also, he's very good at, you know, opening his hips and running with receivers. I, I don't I don't see a Dunze a pulling away from him. No, pull away, pull away from Watts. <clears throat> right. That's what would in Watts. La, didn't Watts get picked on a little bit last year? I might be wrong on that. I'll look that up. Just no, to I, confirm, thought they, but... I thought I mean, I thought they did fine as far as I mean, one of the touchdowns was a long run. And remember, they only gave up. But it was was 20. That was 27 and a few. A few people were like making either their first starts or things like that. And the, and the offense just, I, I thought the defense played well enough to win last year. Just the offense just didn't do anything. And it, in the second half, Washington just kind of held the ball the entire second half. <clears throat> so that's true. I, I actually thought the MVP of the game for us at corner was Terrence Brooks. I thought he played fantastic yeah, Brooks, last season. Brooks did some really good things. Brooks has been playing. He's played well this year. He's been uh, getting overlooked. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, as we end on the defensive note, I <clears throat> I understand Texas fans' angst about the secondary, but I would also say in the month of November, they played a lot better than they did in the month of October. So they did get better, um, and you played some of the better p- passing attacks later that year. Um, as far as the deep ball, I mean, you're going to give up some of those. Um, you just can't let it happen too much. It, it, but it can't be you, – you, you can give up two. You can't give up six. Yeah. That, that's the thing. But you're going to – you're going to give up some. you just – sorry, you got th- if you got three NFL wide receivers, chances are you, they're going to they're gonna make a play once in a while. You know, Washington's got a decent defense, but I don't think they're great by any means. I think they're probably – a middle to upper tier defense in the Pac-12. Um, they're averaging about 20, 24 points per game this season, scoring defense. They rank 51st in the FBS. Um, and then, you know, I, I, the one thing that really sticks out to me about them is they've they've given up a ton of passing yards this season. Um, they rank, I believe it's second from the bottom in the FBS in uh, passing defense. Now, there is... There's an asterisk that comes with that where, you know, Washington has given up a ton of passing yards. Yes, Washington ranks 11th in the FBS in passing defense. They're giving up 200, 263 pass yards per game. Now, they rank in the middle of the pack in the Power 5 in yards per coverage snap. Um, a lot of teams are getting down against them this season in the Pac-12, and they're just getting in shootouts. So they're just facing a lot of passing plays. They are the only team in the power five this season that has faced over 500 passing attempts on defense. So um, there is just more of a volume stat at this point, but 
nonetheless, there have been some bad teams that have moved the ball against Washington's pass defense. So, but I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, Washington has been decent. I would say pretty good against the run. Um, they rank in the middle of the pack in the FBS in run defense around 134 yards per game, but they do allow over four yards per carry. So uh, Texas got a chance to be pretty efficient against them on the ground. I think pretty methodical and balanced on offense. Um, you know, Texas has the size advantage in the trenches here, you know, where Texas has most of their offensive linemen all six foot three or taller around 315, 320 pounds. Um, if not, if not bigger than that. And so, you know, Washington's defensive front, they got some decent guys up there. They do have some size along the interior, but I just don't think that they have, I, I don't think they have the playmakers up front. They definitely don't have the quality of defensive line anywhere near what Texas does. Um, I even think that they have what two guys in their defensive line rotation that are uh, below 300 pounds. And so Texas, you know, you're going to have, so you're going to have a chance here to move some guys off the line of scrimmage. Um, I believe it's Ulamu Ale is, is their biggest guy up front about six foot six, uh, 330 pounds. So, um, Washington, you know, they've got some decent players at linebacker. Braylon tries coming off the edge is a pretty quality playmaker. And then in my, uh, article earlier this week, um, I pinpointed Jabbar Muhammad, the Oklahoma state transfer and Malik Muhammad's cousin, um, senior transfer that's faced Texas twice already is, is kind of the playmaker you got to watch in the secondary. Um, also think Michelle Powell at, uh, at the nickel position slot corner is, is a quality player there too. He's been pretty disruptive this season for Washington. So Texas just needs to be themselves, which is to be a balanced team and kind of feed what's working. Um, <clears throat> Texas can do, can take a chapter out of Washington's book, though, if they do get up, and that's kind of just hold the ball. That's what Washington <laughs> did last year. Now, don't don't get too carried away because sometimes Texas has slowed the game down and then they let the other team back in. So, yeah, wouldn't do that. But <clears throat> if you can run the ball, uh, especially with Cedric Baxter, who's, I think, been playing well, Jaden Blue has been playing well, uh, Trey Weisner, I hope he gets some carries. I really like what he's doing when he gets the ball. Um, you got to do that. And I expect Quinn Ewers to keep playing well. He's been playing his best football since he came back from his injury. Looks like he's getting better every week, sometimes within the game. You know, I thought uh, against TCU, he played really well. You know, he made that bad interception, then he just hit some dimes. You're like, oh, yeah, this is why we, everyone was raving about this kid coming out of high school. And then against Texas Tech and Oklahoma State, I thought he was he just he was just fantastic. Uh, I think if we can get Trey Wisner carries in that game, that would be fantastic because that would probably yeah. Uh before rambling on too much about random stuff with the Washington defense, I uh, you know for Quinn Ewers, I mentioned it earlier. You you gotta avoid the big mistake here because Washington secondary does have some guys that can make you pay. Um, again, I mentioned Jabbar Muhammad, 16 forced incompletions this season, leads all Pac-12 cornerbacks, he leads all he let he let all Pac-12 cornerbacks in um, in uh, pass breakups, three interceptions this season. Pa Washington actually had over 50 pass breakups this season, tied for the lead in the Pac-12. Um, so, you know, Washington has managed to do what USC couldn't do. That's half of an elite offense and a decent defense. Yeah, which is what's gotten them to this point because they played, yeah, you know, like you said, played well enough on defense with, yeah, an elite passing offense, and. Yeah, I don't think there's a ton that you have to say really about this Washington defense. It's it's more about Texas on the execution front because you got some time to get a lot of your playmakers healthy where you had the ankle injury to Xavier Worthy in the Big 12 championship game. But he's been getting more and more practice reps and you know getting that ankle right. Same thing with Jatavion Sanders. And he's been dealing with that ankle injury really for the entire second half of the regular season. And, you know, this is the longest time he's going to have to rest and heal up where you got a healthy Adonai Mitchell. You got healthy Jordan Whittington, um, you know, two guys with a lot of experience. You know, Adonai Mitchell, ton of experience in this game. That's one thing I can't gloss over. He's got a, he's got a touchdown catch in each of the last four college football playoff games he's played. So, I mean, talk about a guy on the big stage that can make Washington pay that there's no one better there. Um, you know, Xavier Worthy, I don't – Is I think Jabbar Muhammad is someone that can – play decently well against Worthy. You know, Muhammad's been a guy that's been stepping up in some big games. I uh, had two interceptions and a two-point win for Oregon, or, uh, Washington this year against Oregon State, a top-10 game on the road. So he's good. 
it's more on yours to be able to deliver the ball where it needs to be so that Muhammad's not getting that early break on the ball and able to time it and get the interception. And so, you know, if yours is dishing the ball out early, Texas able to set the tone to the line of scrimmage, able to run the ball with that outside zone ground game with Jaden Blue and, and CJ Baxter, I think you're in business. Um, you got anything else you would want to mention about the Texas offense versus the Washington defense? Uh, no, but I just I I'm hoping that this month DJ Campbell is not the an elite pass blocker yet, but as long as he's a decent one that's not giving up like easy rushes to Quinn Ewers, I think we I think we should be fine. Uh, yeah, as far as a, as far as a, th- this is a game, I'm very very glad we have Jake Majors because Majors is a great field general. <clears throat> Yeah, no. definitely. I mean, he's he's been one of the best centers in the Big 12 this season. And he's been, he's been one of the best centers in the country. Yeah, it'd uh, be great to who, get him back for another season. But and anyone who he, he proved that when he went down in Red River. Yeah, although uh, I thought the backup, I think uh, Connor. Uh, no, was it was it, was it, was Connor it Robertson? Connor? Was, who is it? Who went in? Connor Robertson went in there because yeah, Cole Hudson yeah, was still Robertson, dealing with injury. Yeah, not, I was thinking, not, not Hayden Connor, Connor Robertson. I thought yeah, Connor Robertson yeah. played very well, but you need Jake Majors. Majors is – he makes everything easier. He sees things, and uh, he helps Quinn Ewers, obviously, a lot too. So, Yeah, very true. Um, before we get to score predictions, I did an article on the site yesterday that was talking about three freshmen who could break out for Texas. This could be true freshman or redshirt freshman. Who would you pick as your freshman to break out for Texas in this game? Of any. CJ Baxter. Okay. I've I picked Jonte Cook just because I've been waiting for it to happen. Um, I don't know if Cook's gonna play that much though. I yeah. I, the only way I could see that happening is if the plan this week was okay last year we did we spread the ball out and quinn did really well so now that we have better receivers let's just go five wide a bunch of times and see what they do which honestly wouldn't be a bad idea because i bet you the the defensive coordinator is like oh i wasn't expecting them to do that but uh because i mean i mean heck it would be a surprise to us if they did that but then yeah I've been mentioning him as a breakout player for the entire season. So I agree with you. I, I just would like to see it. Um, another player that I think I would like to see is Jamon Tapp. Um, I mean, he's from Louisiana. We've been waiting for him to, you know, flash. He's, he's, he's flashed a little bit, but. Still looking for that first career sack, I think. And so this would be a great game to do it. I'm um, going back to his home state. Um I think more realistically, I said Malik Muhammad. I know that he's had some big games this year, but I think that this could really be where he gets in, you know, gets in front of the national stage and really shows what he can do. Um, you know, he's knocked out in the second half. Yeah, he, I think he was knocked out with injury a little bit there in the second half against Oklahoma State. So his snaps ended up being a little limited there. And so you know, another guy that, you know, will be fully healthy heading into the game could have a big one for Texas. They'll definitely need it in the secondary. Um, okay. Score prediction time. I don't even remember what I said the first time. So going Texas 41, Washington 36. <clears throat> okay. Um, the over under right now, I, th- which would be the most Texas defense has given up all season. <laughs> What's the, was it OU 34? Yeah. Okay. Um, so right now the over under is set at 63 and a half. We are four point favorites. I think that's, I think that's right around where I'm thinking. Um, I'm thinking a little bit lower scoring than you. I'm going to go 37, 28, Texas. It's almost a 10 point win. Yeah. I, I think there's a chance where if we come out of the gates, and we can get some de- and we can get some stops on defense here. You'd know, say even if we get stops on two of the first three drives, where I I think we're good enough on offense against Washington's defense. You start pulling away a little bit. You know, Washington's gonna, you know, their game plan's gonna get a little bit more predictable because they're not gonna be running the ball as much. They're gonna want to try to spread it around and get some bigger plays on offense. All right. I think they're I think that Texas can set the tone pretty early here. I guess what I'm getting at. So um yeah, I'll buy that. Yeah. 
I'm, I mean, I got a lot of hope for it on Monday. That's for sure. Uh, it, it, we're in for a fun one. Uh, stay tuned with us again, back in, uh, back at home on YouTube. So, uh, be a little bit more consistent with the content, but stay tuned with us at the site. We've had content coming every day for the playoffs. So we can continue to do so. Um, anyway, you got anything, anything else you want to add before you get going? Nope. Let's get back to, let's get back to Houston. Yep. All right. For, uh, Andrew Miller, Tark LaCour, the hook of the hook of more show. Pretty much it. Welcome. Welcome.